Welcome everyone to the very first edition of Marks on TV. I am your boy Troy from the main event Marks and we're going to be talking today about Midnight Mass. It's a Netflix original and we'll talk more about the uh, channel and all that stuff coming up here in just a few but let's get into this shall we. So if you don't want spoilers for the show in any way shape or form this is a spoil fill review so spoiler alert. <coughs> So in a nutshell, Riley, the main character, he is like uh, in a startup and investments and all that stuff, living the high life in the city. He is drunk one night at a party, drives home and hits some girl and kills her, a young girl. And he gets like four years in prison. So he gets sent away and that's like the beginning of the show. Because of this, on his parole, he gets sent to live with his family, his parents on Crockett Island. Crockett Island is like a really small uh, fishing community that only like 178 people live on. So it's really small and secluded and whatever, but yeah, basically there ain't anything to do on this island. But he goes there and his mother is like all super thrilled to have him there, but his dad, who is Elliot from E.T., is like, nah, I don't want you here, bro. And he's like not super happy with him. I mean, for obvious reasons. And they're like, you're gonna come to mass with us, by the way, there's one church on the island, it's Catholic, and that is it. And there are a lot of Catholic themes on the show, kind of revolves around that, because it's called Midnight Mass. I'm not Catholic, I'm Protestant. So, I don't know any of the traditions, so some of this stuff was, like, over my head. But either way, they talk about how the 80-some-year-old dementia uh, patient of a priest that they've had on the island forever, uh, Monsignor Pruitt, yeah, everybody saved up to send him to Israel like one time before he dies. So that was nice of him, but they don't realize how bad off he is with dementia. We'll get into that. It plays a huge part of the story, but he's not there still. But who does show up is Father Paul. Our Father Paul is young and charismatic and he brings a lot of people into the church and all that. So that's cool. But what we see earlier is uh, him dragging this giant trunk. We don't know it's him yet. But he's dragging this giant trunk in the middle of the night into his uh, priest house. It's a little tiny house that he lives in right next, like on church grounds. And he drags it in there in the middle of the night. We don't think anything of it, but we'll find out more about it as the show progresses. So everybody getting the sacraments on the island, which for those of you that don't know is communion. It's like you get the wafer and the wine and whatever. It's supposed to be like to represent the body of Christ and uh, the blood of Christ. You drink whatever and... So anyway, everybody getting that stuff on the island is like being healed or getting a little younger, feeling better and whatever. And uh, you don't really think anything of it or they're not thinking anything of it. But us at home are like, what's going on? Most of the old people on the island, by the way, are just young people in a lot of latex and makeup and with a wig on. E. Nobody really thinks anything weird about... Father Paul, he kind of reveals in flashbacks when he's giving confession to God, whatever, he kind of re recounts his whole story. Apparently, he's Monsignor Pruitt. Yeah, the 80-some-year-old guy with really bad dementia. Nobody on the island, even though they've known him his whole life, thinks anything of it. And my wife was like, why don't they just call him out? They were like, it's clearly Monsignor Pruitt, but he's younger. I'm like, because who the hell would think that? I mean, yeah, it's very obvious, but at the same time, who's going to be like, isn't that the 80-some-year-old guy, you know, that we sent over to Israel? Why is he young now? And he's great, and he's moving around. Normal people don't usually think like that. But either way, it's him. He went over to Israel, and he, like, wandered away from his tour group, whatever, and nobody saw him. So he wanders out into a giant sandstorm, and he finds a cave in the middle of the desert to seek shelter in. While he's in the cave, he sees, like, glowing eyes in the back of the cave, and he's like, well, that's weird. And he's lighting matches, and it gets closer and closer. And it's this, like, blah, this, this, like, pale whatever with giant bat wings. And it jumps him and starts drinking the blood from his neck. And he's like, is this an angel? I mean, it's got wings. Not everything with wings is an angel. And last I knew, there wasn't... And I mean, I realize Catholic Bible is a little different than the Protestant Bible. But I still don't think there are any stories about angels drinking blood, bro. The thing drinking his blood is like, you know what? 
I got some use for you. I don't know, like, it doesn't say this, but, you know, whatever, internal thoughts, I guess. And he, like, slices his wrist with his super sharp nail, and he, like, pours his own blood into Monsignor Pruitt's mouth, and he drinks it. And when he wakes up the next day, he's all young and feeling good, and he's like, whoa. And he, like, pledges allegiance to this angel. And that's what was in the trunk, bro. He brought a demon thing I'll explain more about later in a trunk all the way from Israel. Where was TSA? How do you get a giant creature in a trunk through TSA and nobody's like, hey, um, that's too big for your carry-on? I don't know. Either way. I guess they're putting the blood in the communion wine. So everybody who's drinking it is getting a little bit, you know, better off, a little more invigorated. Before we get into all that, there is one thing, it's like an Easter egg in the show, and I didn't think anything of it until like the very end of the show, and I'll tell you why. So there's a doctor on the island, one doctor for 178 people, whatever. But Dr. Sarah, she is a lesbian, and the reason that is important, I'm not just saying that, but the reason that is important is because of this. So she's with her girlfriend at like the town picnic celebration thing for fishing season. And Father Paul is like staring at her kind of weird from across the way. And they're like, oh, we're making him uncomfortable because we're lesbians. I mean, probably a good guess, but turns out that wasn't it. And we'll get into why later. And Dr. Sarah's like, my old priest used to stare at me the same way growing up. So that part didn't make any sense unless the old priest had kind of suspicions as like, she's a lesbian and I don't like it. Turns out that wasn't it at all, had nothing to do with her sexuality. But again, good guess. And Riley is getting awfully close with this girl, who I forget her name, but she's like a main character in the show. She was in Haunting of Hill House and Haunting of Blind Manor, uh, had major roles in both shows, less so in Blind Manor, but either way. The priest starts an AA meeting on the island so that uh, Riley doesn't have to go to the mainland for his AA meetings and because uh, he wants to get Riley closer into the church and all that good stuff because Riley ain't feeling it but his parents are making him go and he's living with his parents so you got to do what they say I guess. I know I'm skipping around a little bit here but that's how I'm thinking of it. One of the weird going ons at the church started with uh, there's a little girl, the daughter of the mayor, who couldn't walk. She got shot in the spine during a hunting accident by the town drunk, Joe. Well, now she can walk after taking the communion. So everybody's like, it's a miracle. And they're not really thinking too much into it. They're just like, good stuff. You know, God gave us a miracle, whatever. You know, as you do. And other people in the town start getting better and younger and you know, all that other stuff. And Father Paul is getting like sicker. And well, this lady is like the church elder and she's been around the town forever and she cares more about the church than anything else in town. Her name is Bev Keen, but we're gonna call her Dr. McDreamy Killer because she was a character on Grey's Anatomy and she killed Dr. McDreamy by accident. So we're gonna call her Dr. McDreamy Killer. Dr. McDreamy Killer uh, is holding a meeting in the house of the priest one night with the mayor, his wife, and this other dude who's like a church elder, I guess, who helps out around the church. And Dr. Paul just comes in one night and is like, I'm gonna die. And he's just like, Bleh, and dies. And they're like, oh no, this is terrible. And I was like, dude, this is like episode four of a seven part series. He can't possibly be dead. Like what's gonna happen? And so he comes back to life. He's like, oh, I'm alive. I'm fine. And they're all like, oh, it's a miracle. You know, as you do. And he comes back to life, but now he can't go in sunlight. They don't know it at first, and Bev is the first to find out. And she's just like, this will be fine. We'll just have mass at night now because, you know, you burn when you walk into the sun. That's normal, right? You're a healer. You're a, you're a miracle from God. Throughout the whole show, she's like misquoting. I mean, she's like quoting Bible verses, but she's like attributing them wrong and whatever. And she's just perverting Bible verses and all that good stuff. But yeah, whatever. It's all to kind of fit her narrative and all that stuff. But now back to the AA meetings that are held at night, because, you know, sunlight. Riley and Joe are now both going because the little girl who got shot by Joe shows up at his house and she's like, I hate you and I hope you suffer and blah, 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 blah. Also, I forgive you and you need to forgive yourself and move on with your life. And it's a really powerful emotional scene. 
But that makes him decide, I'm gonna quit drinking and go to AA and all that stuff, whatever. Well, Joe is like uh, feeling good about himself one day because he really wanted to drink, but he didn't. So he shows up at the priest's house to tell Father Paul, hey, I really wanted to drink, but I didn't. I'm really proud of myself. Father Paul's like, yeah, that's really good. Here, come on, give me a hug. And like, uh, Joe's getting like creeped out by it because he saw something like a newspaper clipping on the wall of like Monsignor Pruitt from years ago. And he's like, you guys kind of look alike. This is weird. Why are you hugging me so tight? And he shoves off and he bangs his head really hard. And he's like bleeding out and dying. Instead of helping him, Father Paul is like, I'm gonna drink your blood, bro. And he like drinks his blood. And the next day, Dr. McDreamy killer walks in and she's like, this is fine. He was a bad person. You had to do what you had to do, you know, drinking blood, whatever, you know, you know, all for God's will, I guess. So she then gets the mayor, his wife, and uh, the big beardy dude, uh, church elder, I guess, in on all the goings on here with uh, Father Paul. And you start to realize at this point, I'm like, dude, they drink blood, they burn in the sun. They're effing vampires. Huh? Not what I expected, but, you know, whatever, subverting expectations, I guess. But, yeah. But now Father Paul's like, ah, oh, man, I really need blood, and I really need that vampire thing to show up, because he's, like, hiding off on Cat Island, killing all the cats. Yeah, they have an island full of cats and no people, and he drained the blood of all the cats and killed them all, and they washed up on shore. Kind of creepy. And as a cat dad, it's kind of... Mm. But he shows up at the... Uh, uh, recreation hall, whatever, where the priest is, and he's, like, draining his blood into a vial so that the priest can drink it, and Riley walks in on it, and he's like, oh, snap, and Papa Vampire here is like, nah, bro, and he attacks him, and he kills him, so you think, he's, like, drinking his blood. Again, I'm like, dude, this is, like, we got, like, uh, two episodes left. What is going on? But he comes back to life, and uh, Father Paul's like, well, I guess I gotta tell you now. So he tells him all the stuff about what happened, and he tells him, hey, bro, you're a vampire. It's nice to point out they never use the word vampire in the show. You just kind of know. But then Riley's like, oh, crap, and he goes to talk to uh, this lovely lady who was pregnant. Uh, we'll get into that here in a minute. And they, like, love each other. So, uh, and Riley had told her about, like, his dream that he keeps having, where they go out in a boat on the ocean, and it's just them, no land around, the sun rises, and then the, the dream ends. And so he's like, I got an idea. And so they do that. And he spills the tea about everything that's happening to the love of his life here. And she's like, okay, well, that's weird, but why are we out here? And he's like, well, you know, basically... Uh, so I have nowhere to go. As the sun's rising, in his mind, he sees the girl that he killed in his drunk driving accident. She's there, and she smiles at him, she takes his hand, then we snap back to reality, and he's, like, burning to death, and he's, like, burning to a crisp like that. A uh, pretty lady that was pregnant is, like, scream crying. She's, like, very upset. Snap back to her real quick, jumping back and forth. She was pregnant. She's not pregnant anymore. She had tests. She's like, what happened to my baby? Did I miscarry? Whatever. And they're like, there's no evidence you've ever been pregnant, ever. Like, your blood levels are okay, and everything's fine. I I, I don't know. Maybe you should see a psychiatrist, because we don't think you were pregnant. But she knows she was pregnant, because the Dr. Sarah lady on the island had sonograms and stuff for her. So she was definitely pregnant. But the baby's disappeared. Snap back to uh, the linear story here we're covering. So they decided, you know, the church people are like, we're going to hold this midnight mass for Easter and make everybody in the town drink blood. It's a blessing from God. We're all going to be angels and blah, 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 blah. So now that this lady now knows and Dr. Sarah knows and her mom, who, by the way, has been getting the sacraments and is now young and vibrant again, she knows because they've been running blood tests, and the blood, like, boils and goes away in the sunlight. So they're like, well, this is weird, and, you know, why is Dr. Sarah's mom getting so young and vibrant again? They all get together, the three of them, and they're like, we're going to put a stop to this. So they go, and they try to stop it all, and things just go bad. A lot of people in the church end up drinking the blood and dying. There's, like, poison in the blood that they laced it with. So it's like a cult ritual kind of thing. They die, and then they come back as vampires. And they basically start, like, eating everybody in the town. Earlier, before this, they had cut the power, they had cut the phone lines, they had cut the uh, cell phone towers, 
and they made sure that the ferry wasn't going to come pick anybody up, so they, they stopped that so nobody could escape. The trio of ladies ended up uh, setting all the fishing boats on fire so that none of them could get to the mainland and kill anybody, so they're basically sacrificing themselves, whatever. Fires end up getting caught all around town, and all the houses are burned, and and uh, Dr. McDreamy Killer is like, this is fine, it's just like in Revelations. This is, this, this is okay, this is fine. And she's like, as long as the, uh, you know, the, the church and the, uh, the, the, the rec center are fine, you know, because we need somewhere to go when the sun comes up, you know, we're, we're fine. Well, you kind of see where that one's going, don't you? So anyway, Dr. Sarah breaks off from the group at one point, and she's like pouring gasoline all over the church. By this point, Father Paul was looking around, he's like, uh, this isn't what I wanted, this is horrible, everybody's dying, blah, 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 blah. So he's like, we gotta put a stop to this. By the way, it's too late to put a stop to this. But he sees Dr. Sarah about to set fire to the church, and he's like, this is good, this is good. And he's like, I'm, I'm very proud of you. By the way, I'm your real father. And she's like, what? And big beardy McBearson sees her about to set fire to the church and shoots her dead. And Father Paul's like, what the F, bro? And he, like, takes him out. I forgot to mention before this, uh, Sarah's mom tried to shoot the big daddy vampire and he took her out and made her, like, bit her and made her a vampire too. So now she's, like, all the way young again and, yeah. This lady decides that she's going to stop all of this and she sets fire to the rec center while everything is burning and she gets attacked by Big Papa Vampire who decides to drain her blood and he's so into drinking her blood that she takes a knife and is able to slice up his wings so he can't fly that fast and that far away so he can't get off the island. So he's kind of screwed now. And then Father Paul decides, you know what, we need to just, you know, light this place up. And he uh, lights the church on fire and burns that to the ground. And uh, Dr. McDreamy Killer is like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? There's got to be some place, right? What about the boats? And Big Beauty McBearderson is like, well, all the boats have been uh, set on fire. There's no place to go. We're pretty much screwed. And everybody in the town kind of like accepts their fate and they're like, yeah, this is fine. We're fine. By the way, I forgot to mention that uh, the formerly crippled daughter of the mayor and Riley's little brother, who I have yet to mention, are in love. And they end up escaping. They get on like a little boat and they're like paddling away from the island while all this is going on, watching it burn. The sheriff and his son have a nice moment. They're both Muslim. They're the only Muslims on the island. They have a, mom a nice moment at the end where they accept their fate and they kind of do a little Muslim prayer on the uh, on the beach and whatever. The sheriff is bleeding out because he got shot, which I didn't mention, but you'll see why. But he's like bleeding out to death and his son was testing out Christianity. Wrong time for that, bro. And he drank the, uh, you know, the poison and all that and killed himself, came back as a vampire, and so he's gonna die. They're doing, like, a little Muslim prayer to, you know, towards Mecca on the, on the beach and all that and having their nice little father-son moment before they meet their final end. Bev Keen is freaking out there because she's like, why? I was supposed to live. I'm better than everybody. And, you know, she doesn't live, so whatever. And everybody kind of joins hands and hugs and sings hymnals and whatever as they're, you know, roasting to death. So there's that. And then as the two kids are floating away from the island, the little girl looks at the guy and she's like, uh, I can't feel my legs anymore. And he smiles. And it's kind of a weird end of the show, but I guess that means her vampire blood is gone. And we see the demon kind of flap flying away, but... The boy's like, well, his wings are so damaged and it's like 30 miles to the nearest shelter. He ain't gonna make it. So that's the end of the show. So this show is pretty ambitious. It covers a lot of ground, uh, a lot of different themes and whatnot. I will say I like how respectful they kind of were to, I mean, as much as a horror film can be that deals with vampires, they were fairly respectful to Catholicism and Islam at the same time. As I mentioned, the sheriff was uh, Muslim. He was the only like non-Christian or atheist character on the show. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. He was tolerant and let his son check out the church and whatever if he really wanted to, to see, you know, what he wanted to do. They didn't talk crap about Christians or Catholicism or anything. I mean, obviously there was a one self-righteous character in the show, you know, Dr. McDreamy Killer. But other than that, it was all you know, uh, handled pretty well. A lot of themes of forgiveness of, you know, others and yourself in the show, which was cool. I like to see that kind of stuff. 
fear of the unknown, fear of death was a big thing. Like, Riley was thinking about the death of that girl throughout the whole show, and then his own death and his own life. What does it all mean? Father Paul, or Monsignor Pruitt, whoever you want to call him, he was sitting there at the end with uh, Dr. Sarah's mom, and they were kind of talking about the affair they had, which made Dr. Sarah. And he was talking about the reason that he went through with all of this in the first place wasn't just for selfish reasons for himself, but he didn't want her to die and her to suffer with dementia. And he wanted to keep the whole family alive and maybe spend more time with them and whatever and get to know them better. So there's that. If you're ranking this against the haunting shows, Haunting of Hill House and Haunting of Bly Manor, uh, I don't know. I mean, in some ways it holds up with the themes and whatnot. It was very ambitious, like I said, but uh, I really like Haunting of Hill House better. Haunting of Bly Manor was also pretty damn good. It was different. I definitely want to review the haunting shows at some point. Maybe I'll do that in the near future, but for now, we're just covering this one. All in all, I think if you've got eight-ish hours to burn, you know, with the, the overrun of the, uh, each episode, then, yeah, it's, you could find a worse way to spend eight hours. I mean, I watched it all in one weekend. I binged it. It was pretty damn good. I will say it's creepy, very creepy. Um, a lot of creepy themes, not just on religion, but, you know, just a lot of other stuff in there is just creepy and in and, and a real human, not even just supernatural, but real human sense. It was creepy. The two critiques I will have about this show, one, the makeup and everything on putting a young person and old person makeup. I know why they did it, but oh my gosh, it was, it was very obvious every time. And you're just like, kind of takes you out of it in certain places, but you know, whatever. They did some of that in Bly Manor and Hill House as well, mostly Bly Manor, but it's just, ugh. The other thing uh, I had to critique about the show definitely is all the monologuing. There were so many monologues, like you get this monologue, it's like a 15 minute scene with a 10 minute monologue from the sheriff towards the end. Like Dr. Sarah goes in to tell him, it's like, hey, uh, at the mass tonight, everybody's going to turn into a vampire and die. I mean, not in those words, but you get it. And he's like, let me tell you about my backstory. So I was, a, I became a cop after 9-11, and New York was super racist to me, and now I'm here. And it's like, and he said it, I, he took like 10 minutes to go through this whole backstory. And I'm like, we don't have time, bro. Like, why was this scene needed here? Like, it's just, they dragged it out. Like, I feel like the story needed more time to breathe than a regular movie runtime, but eight hours of runtime was too much. You probably could have condensed the show into like six episodes or five episodes and been fine, but it's very heavy in certain areas, and then in other areas, it's like kind of a let me up. I don't know. All in all, I dug it. I think you'll dig it too. I definitely suggest going watch it, especially if you're into horror and supernatural stuff, and if you like the vampires. So just real quick about this channel. Um, obviously, we're the main event marks, and we deal with mostly wrestling. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts, not just here on YouTube. Uh, and it's all retro, evergreen, classic wrestling stuff that we cover. So definitely check that out. Like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Download all of our episodes. Uh, we do you know, an episode every single Wednesday, and then we do a bonus show the second to last Friday of every month. So we've got quite a few, uh, you know, 80 plus, almost 90 episodes in the can. With the bonus shows, it's almost 100 episodes in the can. It might be 100 at this point. It's got to be 100 episodes in the can at this point. I, I, I lost count. Either way, go check up on that. If you don't like wrestling, we're going to bring you a lot more stuff here. We're doing marks on TV, doing marks on video games, and marks on movies. So we're going to cover a lot more stuff. We're going to do reviews like this. We're going to do some previews, some gameplay footage, trailer reactions, show previews, movie previews, game previews, all that kind of stuff. We're going to do definitely do a lot more for WWE 2K22 coming out in March. So check that out. Stay tuned for that. Please, please like and subscribe. We're going to change and we'll take all your suggestions, you know, under advisement. So definitely comment and go to our Linktree account there. You can follow us on all forms of social media. And if you guys like this stuff enough, maybe we'll make it into a podcast version on top of just doing some little YouTube videos here and there. So yeah, like and subscribe and uh, comment down below. Peace out.